వరల్డ్ హాస్పైస్ అండ్ ప్యాలియేటివ్ కేర్ డేగా స్విమ్స్లో ఈ అవగాహన కార్యక్రమాన్ని నిర్వహిస్తూ ఉన్నాం ముఖ్యంగా క్యాన్సర్లో చాలామంది మొదటి స్టేజెస్లో కాకుండా చివరగా వచ్చినప్పుడు వాళ్ళకి మనం పూర్తిగా నయం చేసే అవకాశం ఉండదు ఏదో కొంత కాలం ఇంకా జీవితం ఉంటుంది రకరకాల ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ వస్తూ ఉంటాయి అలాంటి వాళ్ళు వాళ్ళ ఆయుష్ ఉన్న దాకా వాళ్ళ జీవితాన్ని తక్కువ కష్టాలతో వీలైనంత ఆనందమయంగా గడపడానికి కోసం ఏర్పాటు చేసే ప్రక్రియనే ప్యాలియేటివ్ కేర్ అంటారు ఇది మన బాలాజీ ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ ఆఫ్ ఆంకాలజీ సందర్భంలో ఇది ఒక ప్రత్యేకమైన సర్వీస్ కింద స్విమ్స్లో అందిస్తూ ఉన్నాం అలాగే కేవలం క్యాన్సర్లోనే కాకుండా గుండె బాగా దగ్గర తిన్నప్పుడు అంటే ఎండ్ స్టేజ్ హార్ట్ డిసీజ్ అని కిడ్నీ బాగా తిన్నప్పుడు దెబ్బ తిన్నప్పుడు ఎండ్ స్టేజ్ కిడ్నీ డిసీజ్ అని ఎండ్ స్టేజ్ లివర్ డిసీజ్ అని అలాగే కొంతమందికి బాగా బ్రెయిన్ స్ట్రోక్ వచ్చి రికవర్ కాకుండా ఉన్నప్పుడు కానీ ఇలాగా కొన్ని రకాల దబ్బులకి ఎక్కడైతే మనము క్యూర్ అనేది అందించలేము అలాంటప్పుడు వాళ్ళని వాళ్ళ మానాన వాళ్ళ కర్మకు వదిలేయకుండా వాళ్ళకు మిగిలినటువంటి జీవితాన్ని వీలైనంత సుఖమయంగా చేయడం కోసం ఉద్దేశించిందే ఈ ప్యాలియేటివ్ కేర్ దీంట్లో ఫిజిషియన్స్ సర్జన్స్ రేడియోథెరపిస్ట్ నర్సెస్ సైకాలజిస్టులు ఫిజియోథెరపిస్టులు ఈ రకంగా ఇది ఒక ఏడెనిమిది మంది స్పెషలిస్టులు కలిసి ఈ సర్వీస్ని స్విమ్స్లో అందిస్తూ ఉన్నాం ఈ రోజు ఈ ప్యాలియేటివ్ కేర్ డే సందర్భంగా ఈ అవగాహన కార్యక్రమాన్ని నిర్వహించి ప్రజలందరూ కూడా స్విమ్స్ అందిస్తున్నటువంటి ఈ ఒక చక్కటి కార్యక్రమాన్ని తమ తమ బంధువులు మొదలైన వారు ఎవరి స్నేహితులు ఎవరికైతే దీని అవసరం ఉంటుందో దాన్ని హితోధికంగా వాడుకొని ఇవ్వవలసిందిగా ప్రార్థిస్తున్నాం It is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you on the occasion of World Hospice and Palliative Care Day. This day is usually observed annually on October 12th. This year we are commemorating this day on November 5th with the theme that 10 years since the resolution, how you are doing. It's an introspection of what we are in last 10 years, although the Department of Palliative Care in SIMS is only two years old. The first World Hospice and Palliative Care Day was celebrated on October 8, 2005, founded by the Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance to spread awareness and advocate for equitable access to hope and palliative care worldwide. Once again, I extend a heartfelt welcome to 
everyone present on the desk and I wish you an enriching academic experience as we go through the different academic discussions and reflection of this day on this significant topic like palliative care, how we are doing in last 10 years. Thank you. Request our director, come Vice Chancellor, Professor Ravi Kumar, sir, to kindly address the gathering. A warm welcome to this uh, exciting CME on palliative care. My professor and mentor, Professor Venkopal, who we last recently asked me this question, what is a curative operation in cardiac surgery? So he said the few, he said no, there is only one PDA, head in the arteriosus, rest all the cardiac surgery is palliative. It was very profound uh, statement uh, coming from him. That's when I heard first about the palliative care. Then in 94, when I was in UK, I was making rounds in the thoracic ward and we admitted a late stage, stage 4 carcinoma lung. The morning when I went to make rounds and said, Mr. John, how are you? He said, champion. I was surprised. Somebody with a stage 4 cancer admitted with some malignant pleural effusion and for some palliative treatment was saying he is champion. Then something struck me. There is something different in this man and also something different in the English system where, you know, if man can say he is doing well despite stage 4. Then, as my experience progressed in UK, a lot of patients whom we are about to kind of terminally ill and we counsel the family, with this violence which we see in some parts of our country nowadays, it was not there. But one thing which a lot of people used to ask was, is he painless? Can they see that he or she is painless and comfortable? That's the only wish from the family. That wish summarizes the goal of palliative therapy. Then after coming back from England, had my father who had an end-stage heart disease, was running with a 14-15% dejection fraction, Sometimes it drops to 10%, they used to become acute, breathless and all. In the house itself, we used to start some dopamine and all, and we used to recover within a few hours. Like that, we maintained him for three years with a very good quality of life, kind of a home palliative care kind of thing. That was when we used to think, because he was my father, so we were not trained professionally in palliative medicine, how his spirits can be kept up, how physically he can be made comfortable, how he can lead a reasonable, good social life. So that is when I learned a lot of lot about the palliative uh, care. This is one aspect of the story. Today I chose to speak a few thoughts and a few observations of mine on the traditional Indian system of palliative care. You know, in the history, you find, you must have heard about the epic war of Mahabharata. Then Vishnu Pitamaha gets stuck very badly on the 10th day of the war and he is on the bed of arrows and for his own whatever reasons he chooses to be like that for 3-4 months from that day when he was stuck with you know, arrows all over the place bleeding in pain 
with a potential for infection, battle going around. You can imagine the scenario. So this Indian system kept him alive for good three, four months in that scenario. So that bears, at least I can recollect, that's one of the very eminent examples of palliative care in Indian Park. Then, when we come to the recent times, you all must have heard about Sri Ram Krishna Paramahamsa. He had a very bad uh, throat cancer. He was uh, suffering. So, a lot of his, uh, I mean, at that time, in the late 19th century, the oncology was not so very well developed. So, they used to give some kind of uh, pain medication, etc., but the quality of life was very poor. Including Swami Vivekananda prayed to him, you are nothing but God, you can ask the Taliban to cure, you, cure this all. So, two, three times he refuses, fourth time he goes into, and then prays and everybody is very happy, he must have prayed and he will get cured. He comes out and says, I did ask Mother Kali, but she said, what if, if you are unable to eat food, the all other people, you are the one who are eating through their mouths, isn't it? We have very profound uh, thinking, a very profound thinking. So he couldn't do it. Then, when he was getting closer to the death, one of the young brahmacharis asked him, how are you feeling? He said, it's very painful, it's all, uh, you know, troubling me a lot and all said. But uh, the young brahmachari said, No sir, you look, uh, don't uh, look, you are suffering, you appear to be in bliss. So, Paramahamsa <coughs> laughed at him and said, This rascal could assess my correct state of mind. He was in that higher realm of consciousness where the Whatever is happening to the body, he could dissociate from it. So, it is the body it was who was paining, not the true himself of performance. So, that is what summarizes the Indian system of palliative care. You find a similar thing with uh, Ramana Maharishi also, who had a cancer, who had a similar kind of a attitude. So, what does this teach us? Can everybody become like that? You saw my, I told you about my father. My father was not a big saint or anything. He was an ordinary householder. He used to, but he was a very ardent follower of uh, Jagat Guru Shankaracharya. And I, as we go further, I will tell you some techniques how we could maintain that kind of a equality. Those of you who are interested in this palliative care in the, in the Indian context, I recommend you two important books. One is the Yoga and Cancer. This is a publication that's available in Amazon. It's published by a university, Yoga University, which is located in Munger. Munger is in Bihar which is supposed to be the capital city of Karna, the Mahabharata hero. So in that Munger, there is a university called Bihar School of Yoga, which subsequently was converted into a university, where they are doing with the advanced equipment and uh, a lot of doctors all over the international community, working on the yoga and various aspects, among which one of the significant research outcomes is this book on yoga and cancer. Similarly, there is another book by another uh, big Vedic university. You must have heard, at least the senior must have heard about Mahesh Yogi, who popularized a technique called Transcendental Meditation. There is a huge uh, amount of scientific work done on transcendental meditation. The book name of the book is very simple. The 
you pick it up on a weekend, it's, it's so beautiful, you read it uh, by the, you know, by weekend you will complete the book. It's called Science of Being and Art of Living. That's the, so that Art of Living, the, Ravi Shankarji is one of his students, so he picked up the later part of it and established this, this institution called Art of Living. So, these two books are very, very important. Then going straight into the, the Indian perspective, there are several ways how we approach the Pagayi literature. Because we don't consider human being just as one physical body. We consider him as different sets. What Upanishad describes as Annamaya Kosha is the physical body. Pranamaya Kosha is all your vital energy and forces, life force. Then you have Manomaya Kosha, the feeling part of it. Then the Vijnanamaya Kosha, the thinking part of it. Then the Anandamaya Kosha, the blissful part. So, people advise different kinds of yogasnas at all to increase the uh, physical well-being. And those who cannot do the formal because of terminal illness, there are other equally powerful physical exercises called pranayama, called uh, sukshma vyayama, which generate a lot of life force in the body and you feel much better after doing them for about 20 to 30 minutes. They are very easy to teach, very easy to learn, practice. One of those systems I have been adapting for more than 25 years now. And if I do that every day, I am sure I can go for a 8 hour sprint without any water, any, any other thing. I can go and work for a uh, long operation for 8 hours. They are so powerful. They are very simple. That's a very good value addition to planning this day. The second important thing is, when you go further in, you are talking about the vital sheep or pranamaya kosha, where you have a range of pranayamas. Pranayamas, you know, people usually see only about meditation. But there are pranayamas which generate uh, prana shakti so that See, most of the time the depression, the anxiety, they are all because your energies are low. So there are pranayamas like Kapalabhati, etc., who, which will generate their more prana and other techniques help to distribute that prana across the body so that after the practice there is a general level of well-being. The other very good practice brought out, researched and resurrected by the Bihar School of Yoga is called as Yoga Nidra. Yoga Nidra is not just sleep. It's a kind of a finite state. Kind of what to be precise, it is a conscious dreaming. You, you, you dream. So that is produced consciously. Similarly, meditation is a conscious deep state. Whatever is your mind state, if you can produce it consciously, that, is, that becomes the highest part of meditation called Samadhi, whereas the conscious deep state is the Yoga Nidra, wherein you take a sound stimulus and rotate your awareness through different parts of the body. So at the end, you are taken to a very relaxed and very profound state of calmness. So that is another very powerful tool. It is a tantric tool. People think bad about tantra, but tantra techniques are very, very powerful. More powerful than the routine yoga techniques. So this is one. Then comes your thought process. This is up to this. Then how do you modulate your emotions and your thoughts? Then the story becomes complete. 
For that, I tell you a small story from the life of Buddha. One of the monks, younger monks, been training, asked Buddha, you say life is sorrow, but you say your teachings are going to take us out from sorrow. But I realize you are becoming old, on and off you are becoming diseased. I am sure one of the days you may die. So where is the solution? You are yourself are suffering. Then Buddha thinks for a couple of minutes and gives a profound statement which forms the basis for the palliative care. He says, whenever there is sorrow, he says you are struck by two arrows. One is the first arrow is the physical arrow, whatever disease or injury or whatever you have. More important than the first arrow is the second arrow, which is your reaction to the illness or the injury. So, if to the suffering, the first arrow contributes 10-15%, the second arrow contributes you know, 85 to 90 percent to the suffering of any injury or disease. So, by my techniques of meditation and lifestyle management, you reduce that 80, 85 percent. So, you cannot eliminate sorrow, but you can definitely bring it down to a manageable levels. That is what is the soul of palliative care. So, after that, I tell you a couple of techniques which are generate a kind of a profound dissociation. See, generally, when we say, who are you, we show the body, we say, and what are your, uh, you know, when you are asked to describe, you describe your achievements, your house, your earnings, your car, I mean, your doings. So essentially we have identify ourselves with our body and the mind. But the Hindu system says there is much deeper than it. Because when you grow, there is a sense of I when you are small. Your body has changed, your emotions have changed, your thought, thinking has changed, still you call I. So they say you explore what is the type through the different stages of life what they call in the technical terms as Atma. So, the approach, the Indian approach to palliative care is to find the difference between this. So, they have coined a term called Drutrishya Viveka. There is a seriousness, the so-called I, who is watching all this and rest all what you see here, even the body, even the mind, that you are watching, like a sakshi. So that is all the phenomenal this way. So whatever your problems, you ask where is it coming? Is it in the sakshi, druk, or it is in the drushyam? Drushyam is the, what you are seeing, the seer and the seen. So the problems are in the seen. So regular after that seen, concentrate on the seer, you develop a very healthy detachment from what is happening. Like what happened to Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa or Dabana Maharaj. Similarly, can you achieve, for routine people like us, can we achieve? Yes. There is one more important technique. A lot of people know about the Omkara Dhyana. But the problem is, we only concentrate on the physical aspect of chanting Om. So, the importance is what does Om stand for? There is one Upanishad called Mandukya Upanishad with only 12 mantras, it is the smallest of the Upanishads, which deals with the nature of Omkara and it relates to stages of consciousness. So, I will take just two minutes to explain the basics and then tell you the technique. The OM letter, if you analyze, it has three components. A, U and Ma. And beyond that, there is a gap. Okay? 
this R stands for the physical or the gross point. And also it represents the wakeful consciousness. We are all now awake, hopefully, and that represents that wakeful consciousness. The U part represents our Sukshma Sarira and also represents the dreamy consciousness. I mean, in our scientific medical language, if you want to say, that is the REM sleep. Where, you know, you are asleep but you are dreaming. There is no physical body, but there is an entire world of imagination going on your brain. So, who represents that? Uh, Ma represents the deeper state. Deeper state in the sense, sometimes we sleep profoundly, get up in the morning and say, Oh, I had a very good sleep, very deep sleep. We are deep sleep, there is no mind, no sense organs. What is watching you? Who said that you had a good sleep? That means even in the deep sleep, there is some tiny level of consciousness which is aware of what was happening. So, that is the deep sleep. Ma represents that. Then when you see the total phenomena of all this, you find that there is some kind of awareness in us which permeates through both the awake, dream and the uh, deep sleep consciousness state. That Mandukya calls it as Turiya, the fourth state, though. It permeates through all, it is not a separate one, it is there in your waking state, in your this one, uh, uh, dreaming state and deep sleep state. So, for you to understand easily, I will give you a couple of examples. One is your movie screen. Movie screen is there. Morning you have a morning show, which may be a horror movie. Then you have a first show. It may be a you know, hilarious uh, fun movie and in the evening it may be a, a tragedy movie. But does this action, does the happiness or does the tragedy, are they affecting the screen? They don't affect the screen. It's like a movie. So if you get into this, I will tell you the technique in two minutes how to get that, how to harness that consciousness. Then, what all is happening looks to you like a movie. This I am telling you from practice. It is not uh, uh, theory I am trying to preach out. This is very much easy technique when I tell you the technique I am telling you. The only thing is you need to apply every day. You can't get into that consciousness like that. First day you may be there for one minute, two minutes. Slowly as you progress, you develop that kind of a detachment when somebody comes, you sit in a director's office, somebody comes and calls you all kind of a names, or there is a big strike, still you watch it like a movie, so that you have seen very recently. So that's it. It's a, another example is, suppose you are a station master. So there will be a express will come on to the territory railway station. There will be a lot of bus, a lot of people getting in, getting down. You see, it is like a grateful consciousness. The station master is watching all what is happening. Then after some time, this thing goes off and another good state comes. Then it is still, he will watch. There is not so much activity, some basal activity he will watch. After some time, goods also goes. There is nothing, only empty station. Till the station master is watching for this. So, you are like that station master. So, you just watch what is happening without getting involved into either with the express or with this one or with the empty kind of a. Another similar small example is imagine a fresh lake, fresh water lake where you can see clear water and the under surface is seen the polished whatever algae and all. Now daytime raising sun, sun comes, you will see the reflection of the sun in it. Then in the evening towards the twilight zone, 
you see that light dropping and you can see that brightness in the sky and all reflecting in the lake. Third is the night becomes dark. You can see the stars, dark sky and stars reflecting in it. But the lake remains the same. Imagine your consciousness like that lake and see what is happening through these states of awake, dream and deep sleep. Now that's enough of uh, theory. How to get it into practice? So Mandakya gives you a technique wherein the first thing you concentrate after some basic uh, you know pranayama and other things to make you inward. Because right now if you sit, your mind is going out, senses are going out. So you do some kind of a pranayama or some chanting of home and you interiorize yourself. Then concentrate on the right eye. I mean, there is a logic for all that, so that will become a full class on Mandukya, so I don't deal with it. I just tell you the technique. You chant Om three times. Then there is a pause after the three times. Then reflect on this. Say that I am this physical, I am not this physical body. So my wife, my children, my this one, they are all only related to this physical body not to my true original self. This is how uh, I don't go into further details, I just tell you this much. Then second stage, you come to your throat, imagine a half moon there, then again chant three times Sultara, and then you say, I am not my mind, I am not my remembrances, I am not my projections, whatever is happening in the dream or my prejudices or expectations, all that I am not that. So you go to your heart level, chant home again three times, say, I am not that consciousness which watches the deep sleep. I am not even that. I am more, more deeper. Whatever are deposited in that my subconscious mind, I am not worried about all those my past feelings, trauma, etc. I am not, I detach from that. So who am I? I am the consciousness which is watching all these things. The conscious mind, the dreamy state and the deep state. But I am not part of it. I am only enlightening. Like the light lights the room. It doesn't touch you, me or anything. Similarly, I am that consciousness, so I am beyond all this. And my basic form, that consciousness, the nature of the consciousness is Sat, Chit and Ananda. That's what you find in the popular poem of Adishankaracharya called Siddhananda Rupa Sivo Sivo. So you take that itself as a mantra and chant for a few minutes, then remain silent. And try this as an experimental basis for one week every day. You may not take more than 10 minutes. Ideally, if you can do in the morning and evening. After one week, you see your own family members, your own friends in the working place will find a difference in you, not only you. But the difference will be visible to people around you because you detach and start seeing it. This has a profound impact in palliative care. You can teach this kind of a meditation to them. Their amount of requirement for the antidepressants, their amount of requirement for analgesics and anxiolytics, all that drastically comes down and they need a much more happier life. So being in swims, you have a unique opportunity with your Vedic University, Sanskrit University around. So explore this Indian knowledge systems. That is what they have find a fancy term for it. So explore these Indian knowledge systems and enrich palliative care so that May Lord Venkateshwara 
less swims as one of the best palliative centers in the country. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> I should say it's a very difficult task for me to get you from the ephemeral to the material and from transcendence to wakefulness. But I'll do my best. Renal palliative care is a new entity which has been thought about by the National Kidney Foundation in around 2000, keeping in view of the magnitude of the kidney problem and the amount of the problems the patients are going through. And in addition to the bodily issues that they are going through, the technical advances in medicine have definitely prolonged their life. We are very happy that we have prolonged their life, but at the same time, we are not able to give them equally good quality of life. If I ask any one of you that, how do you describe your life? So you would always say, I am very happy in this life. I would like to continue like this. Of course, I know we do get into the centers of the cyclone and then get further, but we do go out and then be as normal and happy as possible. But at the same time, if I ask you that, how do you like to feel during that? Then, you would immediately close your eyes, turn your head, and then keep quiet. But really, uh, I probably do something to gain dignity out of my what I do. But when I'm unconscious, when I'm painful, when I'm very weak, who would give me dignity? I expect all people around me would give me dignity because if you don't give today, tomorrow you will not get the dignity. So let us make our people realize that we have to give dignity for those people who are passing away this world. And we all should live with an attitude of gratitude. Every minute that is given to us is a great help from the divine and we should live with gratitude of attitude. So with this brief introduction, in the palliative care, most of you are trained as doctors. Doctors in the very primitive sense. We are all looking at cure, but there is care. So palliative care physicians concentrate on care and the rest of all the physicians concentrate on cure. It is pure ego. So if the patient recovers, I am very much satisfied, it's an ego satisfaction. So the thing is, we should go beyond ego, whether they recover or not, you are there by their side. This is what I have understood from what Cecily Sanders has written in her biography. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and depart, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. So all the great men have left their footprints on the sands. It is for us to see them and then learn and to be as good as possible to ourselves and to the people around. That is the philosophy of life. Father of medicine, Hippocrates, he said, cure sometimes, treat often, comfort always. You have all the capacity to give the comfort. That means any moment of time, without expenditure of even a pie, a palliative care physician has the arsenal to make the other people happy. 
whereas the rest of all the doctors do not have the capacity. So when it is so abundantly available with us, why can't we practice that? So it is comfort always. So this is what is the mantra of palliative care. The Dame Sicily <coughs> Sanders started like most of us when we did not enter into medicine as a humanities graduate. One day she thought that my life is getting wasted, why not I help people who are in agony? Then she started helping in, in the past time she had. But over a period of time, she was not understanding how to help them because their agonies are becoming more and more. She's from England. So then she asked them that, how do I help you? She said, my dear girl, you cannot help me at this stage. Then how can I help you? You show me the way. Then she said, unless you are a nurse, you can't help. Then immediately she joined in the Royal College of Nursing and then did her nursing course. And after that, he again came back into the society as a nurse and started helping people. Then she started seeing people who are not happy with whatever service that she was doing. She asked again them that uh, I have come back as a nurse and then you still are not happy with what I do. Then they said, yes, we want doctor's help. So then she thought and she went to Royal College of Physicians and did her medicine. She is FRCS and as well as MRCP. So after that, she again went back to the patients. Then she realized that with cure, it is impossible, only with the care that is possible. So Cecilia Sanders is one of the greatest persons ever born on this earth. And many of you may not know that there is a bigger prize called Templeton Prize, bigger than Nobel. So Cecilia Sanders was awarded Templeton by the King of England, and that is the highest award which is existing as of now in this present day world. So this is what Cecilia Sanders sees. That is the sacrifice. So most of the nurses who are there, I think it's a very God-given uh, opportunity for them to help the patients. So this is when she was nurse, this is when she was doctor, this is when she received the temple Prize. This is her biography. It's a wonderful book, of course, I have said. The most important thing what she said is, you matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. You need not think of anybody. You are the greatest, the only creation of God. There is no other person other than you in this world. When God himself is so unique to you, why are you thinking about other people? So if you think that you are the greatest creation of the God for a purpose, then nothing can shatter your confidence. Okay, now we'll come back to the mundane. When we come across a patient, what is the problem that he is going through? A well, reasonably well-preserved patient, then <laughs> suddenly going into the onset of the disease and then treatment is initiated and treatment is exhausted and life expectancy is just less than six months and he dies and there is bereavement. So at each step, the doctors have divided themselves as the masters of a particular period of our life. If you call pediatrician is allocated for the early young age, physician is for the other problem, surgeon is for something else. And that way, at the end of the day, none of these people are around. It is only in the hospice. If at all we have hospice that much over a period of time, unless you youngsters really think of having hospice like in the West, and uh, the care of bereavement. We all want to die very dignifiedly and then we all want our people to be taken care of during the hour of gloom. That probably two weeks time, who take care of our people? 
This is what the palliative care hospice would take care. So keeping all this in mind, the non-communicable diseases are becoming behemoths. It is becoming really difficult to manage them, like uh, chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, dementias. All these things are becoming too big to be handled by a few trained personnel. As a result, the WHO thought that we should be able to do something. Now, there is a palliative care specialty, but unfortunately, not many people are trained in palliative care. It is for its, for, for its specific reasons. Many people think that we are not respected by doing palliative care, and then we are only involved at the time of death. As a result, not many of the youngsters are taking up palliative care, but this is not so in the West. They are bubbling with enthusiasm. There are wonderful places where palliative care is, uh, is training is available, and then good number of graduates are taking palliative care. So if you observe this, <coughs> while the physician is see, this represents You should realize that I'm 70. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so the most important thing is, uh, as the physician is thinking that he would like to treat the patient, that is the upper part, creative and life prolonging care, There is an area below. A palliative care also starts seeing patient on the day the physician has seen his patient in the OPD. This is the most important thing. If not now, never. So there is an essay in one of our journals. What is the time to initiate palliative care? The essay says, if it is not now, there is no time. That means the moment the physician sees the next consultation, he should go to palliative care. The palliative care physician totally views the patient in a different way. He looks at the psychological aspects, he looks at the spiritual aspects, and he looks at the social aspects. Whereas the physician doesn't have time to ask those things. So the patient is exposed to the holistic approach of WHO health care. And then he is scared when he goes to a physician. And when he goes to a palliative care physician immediately in the next door, he is very composed, he is calm, and he has a direction how to handle the problem. So this is what is happening as a great thought in most of the Western world. And this is what the WHO also wants us to practice. And then this is what has been taught to us in the courses that we have attended in the renal palliative care models. The other thing is prevention is better than cure. Don't wait for the patient to knock at your door and say that I have a disease. And then you look into him and say that yes, you have a disease. It's too late. So the most important thing is uh, try to go into the interiors, try to go into the villages, and then pick up the disease even before he or the patient comes Reporting to us. In so periodic uh, uh, the village level screenings are very important to pick up the disease first. And as the symptoms increase, the physician is very clever. I have done my best. I cannot do anything beyond this. So the palliative care physician has to take over. See now, the initial portion is totally by the physician and just a speck by the uh, palliative care. At the end of the day, 
when it has reached a chronic refractory state, refractory kidney failure, refractory lung failure, refractory heart failure, dementia, total unconsciousness, then the physician raises his hands and say, I have done my best. Now you have to knock it some other door. This is the usual story for all the medical specialties. But in nephrology what has happened is, we started taking these people during some stage into dialysis. And we are fighting so hard to prolong their life, but we are not able to ease them from certain of the disturbances that are occurring in the body because we are not able to remove the toxins fully because our equipment are not capable of handling that much removal of the toxins which are happening into the body. As a result, now the patient is at limbo. He is neither good, but he is progressively bad. And he is becoming weak, he is becoming frail, and a day would come that he cannot tolerate dialysis. And nephrologist says, unlike physician who has given up earlier, now nephrologist gives it up and says that this is beyond my scope. Because you are not going to transplant, so I just leave you in the last. So then where has to go? Then he has to go to the palliative care physician. But luckily in this model, the palliative care physician is all through with the patient. So he's not flabbergasted overnight. So he has been with the patient and then he is directing the patient. And ultimately he will go through end of life care. Usually one, one and a half years before death, that period is called end of life care. This is the time where patient expects maximum from us. And this is the time where, except palliative care physician, all of us shun him. Because we are not trained to handle end of the life care. Okay? So, after the end, during the end of the life care also, we do give dialysis to them. But we are not as uh, emphatic or as masterly as before in following the regimes. We do give them dialysis because they are so frail they can't go through. And after this, they go to hospice. So they are vexed up with us. They would say, enough is enough. We don't want dialysis. We don't want anything. So we want to peacefully leave this world. Please leave us. So then they go to the hospice. Generally, Patients are taken into hospice when the death is expected in days to weeks, usually within six months. Very rarely they go up to six months, but they usually die in few weeks. And this hospice care, there is no dialysis, nothing. If they want to come back to dialysis, they can. But hospices do not have these things. And then they just go through a very peaceful life without feeling pain because of the fentanyl patches or something else or something else and then very happily leave this world. So it's a fantastic um, uh, supply of the care to these individuals by the participation of uh, the palliative care physicians. And after that, when the patient is gone, the doctor does not go away. Like, like a physician like me, I do cardiac massage, but at the end, I declare that so-and-so is dead. And probably I stay a few minutes and then tell them something. But I leave and then become as normal as anybody else. But palliative care, they do not leave. Usually they take care about two weeks. Meanwhile, they settle everything. And uh, they, whatever the papers are to come, they, they look into. And then whatever financial support, wherever the grants are there, they get them and they settle them, they settle their family and then leave the, the story. So this, so at the end of the day, if you just remember this, I think it is worth my spending about half an hour here. So this is what, from nephrology side, as a preventive palliative care, we go into the uh, villages or we go to the schools and then we do school health program. We have picked up several abnormalities that they really do not know that they have 
and then we could do something worthwhile for them. So palliative care is a type of medical care that helps people with serious or life-threatening illness to live as well as possible. It can be provided at any point during the course of serious illness and can be given alongside the other treatments. So the goals of palliative care are improve quality of life. It is not quantity of life. Please don't expect. And reduce pain, prevent or treat symptoms of the disease, treat side effects of the disease treatment. So whatever physician has done, the mistakes, the palliative care people help them. Address psychological, social and spiritual problems. Okay, so whatever they have accepted this terminology, palliative care, but the patients of chronic renal disease who are on dialysis surviving as long as possible, they have a fear that palliative care is always attached to cancer. So they get worried that we got cancer. As a result, the National Kidney Foundation felt for them to accept all our efforts, we have to change the name. So they said it is kidney supportive care. It is nothing but palliative care. It has come in a different guise, different veneer, and kidney supportive care is palliative care for patients of kidney disease. The hospice is the terminal. So the seven C's of palliative care, communication, coordination, compassion, collaboration, continuity of care, continued learning, care in the dying phase. These are the expected qualities, rainbow qualities of this. And this is end of life care, this is what I said. And this is the first hospice that was built in England, in the world, first hospice, Madam Cecily Sanders has built this, it's called St. Christopher's Hospice, London. And this is the difference between palliative care and hospice. So in hospice, there is nothing, no medicines other than fentanyl patches, and then no procedures. I, I, I'll just go through first. Now we'll come to, I have given you a brief understanding of what palliative care is. Now I'll give you a brief understanding of the magnitude of the problem of chronic kidney disease. It has been observed over a period of time managing the patients of chronic kidney disease. Most of the articles now say that chronic kidney disease, the burden is as high and as painful as cancer. So it is no way smaller than cancer. And it is so prolonged, it goes on decades sometimes. Whereas cancer is usually not so. It has a self-limiting end. As far as the global problem is concerned, phenomenally increasing chronic kidney disease. So now it's around 9.1%, 1.2 million people are dying because of chronic kidney disease. A lot of expenditure. And if you really look into the existence of the disease in the society, it is phenomenally very high because it's like an iceberg. What we see in our OPDs in, in our wards is small, very small. And what is existing in the society is phenomenally great. And they also go through all this. Ultimately, so it's always better to pick up chronic kidney disease by screening. So going into the villages, going into different areas, going to schools, going to Udhashram, and going to these, all these religious places and then do something, very small thing, just take a dipstick and uh, just take a BP apparatus. With that, we can diagnose uh, diabetes, we can diagnose hypertension. So 70 to 80 percent of causes of chronic kidney disease are taken care of very easily, not even with one rupee. She is another great lady, she is called Elizabeth Kugler Ross. She is from Switzerland. She was a psychiatrist in uh, US. So anytime you tell the patient that you have a disease, he is damn scared and he goes into depression. So looking at this, she has brought out this model. This is called the deep stages. The denial, anger, bargain, depression, acceptance. 
The most important thing is try to note down the phone number of the patient that you see for the first time in your OPD because you are a villain there. You have told him what he has. All through, he was in dreams, he was in nine cloud, and suddenly you have uttered something. It is true to your heart, but it has hurt him. So, follow him and try to see that he will come back after the depression to you or organize it in such a way that he will pass through all these phases fast and then he will go through the treatment. Please read this. This is a very wonderful uh, thing. And uh, Elizabeth Kubler has written wonderful books. The Death and Dying is a masterpiece. So she has spent all her time in understanding death. She, the, at least I have, what I have read in the books is, uh, she used to conduct classes for medical students. He used to call the patients. And then he, with their permission, she, she used to discuss with them. And she used to ask them, what is it that you have something to say from your life? Then, people of different races, different financial status, different positions, different educational qualifications said usually five things. Of the two are existential questions. From where have I come and to where I go? There is no answer for these two. But the other thing is, did I live well? Did I serve all? Did I love all? These three questions everyone is asking just before death. So what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says is, why don't you ask those three questions today itself and then why don't you try to say, yes, today just before going to sleep, why don't you tell yourself, yes, I loved all. Yes, I lived well today. And so this is what she expects. If you start doing like this, without any remorse, I think you will pass into coma and then leave this world. Anyway, these are all the features of various systems of the chronic kidney disease. I'll go through fast. Umpteen number of uh, the painful processes take place in the kidney. So all these things we have to address. It's very difficult for an nephrologist to address all these things. And in some of them, palliative care physicians are experts. So the best thing is let all our postgraduates learn from them. And so they do, they do very well in their practice in addressing these things. It's very difficult. Most of them, they are patients of our patients. They are not able to eat anything. All the things, they just go wasted. During my fellowship in Canada, it's a very light posting, I used to think, because only nursing home patients come to me during those three months. Most of the times, they just lie down. They don't even eat food. So I used to spend a lot of time with them and used to feed them and to really enjoy it. So, very costly food is just thrown on the table and then they go away with nurses because they have some work to do. They can't just stay like that. Whereas I'm there from morning till evening. I really used to enjoy feeding them. And uh, so somebody has to be there by their side coaxing them to eat. If they don't eat, they get malnourished, they become protein deficient, and then they die very fast. All our efforts will go waste. And uh, neuropathy, very sad thing. They will not be able to sit, they will not be able to lie down, they will not be able to stand, they are not able to sleep. What a uh, treacherous thing to happen during the time of death. Uh, you should uh, watch your dialysis unit, you know, just walk from one end to the other, you will definitely see what is restless leg syndrome. When they lie down on the bed, they can't keep their legs uh, without moving. So difficult. For them. And they have good drugs for them and then uh, the palliative care specialists are there. And another thing is when we just lie down and then we don't work, our muscles become atrophic, they become cachexic. They are not able to walk. And uh, so some exercise, let them just walk about, that's enough. 
I don't take time to on these things. Uh, this is another trajectory that all of you have to take in your mind. It has been identified that all of us will go through death in one form, mostly. There are people who live their life very happily and suddenly drop down like this. I'm just speaking like this, next moment I'm not there. This is what, what happened to Dr. Abdul Kalam. Most fortunate people, not many people would get a death like that. They, they don't suffer anything. See, this is only 7%. Unfortunately, trauma and accident, we really don't consider that as a very pleasant event because our people would think very bad and then they go into depression if we die in accidents. But if we drop dead like that, all of a sudden with a healthy heart and then a good sane mind. So the second other thing is terminal malignancy. They also live reasonably well for a long time and then there is a reasonably rapid downhill. So cancer troubles, but it has a way out at the earliest possible, maybe five years, maybe seven years, maybe. So it's about 22%. And 16%, this is rest of all non-communicable diseases, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, chronic liver disease, chronic heart disease, dementia. So it is like this, sawtooth. We are good for some time, suddenly we go down because of some illness. And we recover and we go down. So like this, it goes on for decades. So it's terrible for us, it's terrible for the people around who are looking after. And Alzheimer's disease. So we are totally oblivious to what's happening, but people around are really suffering like anything. So the best thing is to die like this. And it's not in our hand, but this is avoidable. If you avoid diabetes, if you avoid the, uh, the hepatitis B infections, and if you avoid hypertension to a great extent, and uh, stop smoking to a great extent, we can escape this. So, with so many problems, when nephrologist is asked to look after, alone we can't, that's what. So then we go into supportive care. So at the supportive care, at every level, we want palliative care people to help us. So this is what the National Kidney Foundation in 2015 has done. It has started kidney supportive care and asked all the major countries to be part of this exercise and most of the countries have fallen in. So this is end of the life care. End of the life care is a little bit uh, troublesome because uh, you have to have an advanced planning. You have to make all the papers ready for the sake of the patients. So, and then take very major decisions to withhold treatments. And this is called advanced planning. And then finally you have to withdraw from dialysis. So above the age of 85 years, if their hearts are not able to sustain the dialysis that we are doing, and then they are in coma conditions, so we have to withdraw, withdraw them from dialysis. And we have to see that they are managed in hospice. And if they are still conscious, then they go away from dialysis and they are managed in com comprehensive conservative care. So care of the terminal illness, Cecilia Sanders has written in her book that she has asked the patients who are dying of malignancies that what do they expect from us? What most of the patients have said is sit by my side for some time and hold my hand. I don't require anything else. So all youngsters should start practicing sit by the side of the patient for some time, irrespective of the disease, hold their hand. You don't lose anything. Just hold their hand. Later on, you may wash your hands, but hold their hand, that's all they, they need. It's a very famous painting. <coughs> In this, you see, doctor is carrying it the patient. He has done all. He has exhausted. There is nothing else that he can. So this is what 
he is doing. Okay, this is the experience of our unit over the last 10 years. So, we went through the renal supportive care training in Manipal. And he is Dr. Brendan from Australia, one of the world authorities on, he is a nephrologist and then a renal palliative care person. And he is professor from PGI, he is from Chennai, she is from Kerala. And what you are going to hear next speaker is Palak. So, she was also a member of here. Look at this old man, a great gentleman, godlike. His name is Dr. Rajgopal, an anesthetist by uh, qualification. He started for all bragging purposes palliative care in India and uh, pushed the palliative care to its end almost. And uh, he stays in Trivandrum. He's called father of uh, the palliative care. It so happened that I could sit by his side in one of the conferences where there is a participation. And these are all our publications on various aspects of palliative care from our unit. This is for as far as the nutrition and then uh, malnutrition from the patients of uh, dialysis. And this is their branch chain amino acids, they have very low amino acid levels. As a result, they are, their immunity is down and then they are prone for infections. And this is, after supplementing L-cornitin, they get back their muscle powers. And this is the exercises, how do they make the bones supple and then do them exercises. This is what we have done in peritoneal dialysis. And comprehensive, so this is what we have written myself, Palat, all in palliative care uh, journal, an article. And uh, the most important thing is we always forget the caretaker. The phenomenal burden the caretaker. See, for example, just recapitulate our mother. Let us say we have, we have gone through fever for one week and we don't sleep in the night. So mother has to do every household chore during day and the night she becomes sleepless. That is <coughs> care. So, these caregivers are subjected to phenomenal strain. So what are all the problems they have? So this is published in Indian Palliative Care, Burden, Coping Mechanisms and Quality of Life in them. And then uh, what is stress coping of the patients undergoing maintenance dialysis? This is with own science lady, I've done it. And then factors influencing scales of burden. So how to calculate their burden, how to magnify, look at the magnitudes of their and then what is the quality of life? How to improve? So it's also in palliative care. And then the employment status. At the end of the day, when we are spending lakhs of rupees, are we taking them back to the employment? Not even 25% of the people are able to go back and then sell. So we have to think of doing something also for their uh, support. So this is published in Indian Nephrology. And then uh, they have a lot of pro-writers. What exactly the changes take place? That is published in International Journal in, in uh, Hemodialysis International. And this is uh, the extent of pro-writers, how to manage all the disease accepted in uh, Saudi Journal of Medical Sciences. And uh, this is the last. Emily Dickinson, I like this poem very much. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life, the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. That means that day is enough for me. So thank you for this opportunity. So uh, our next session uh, will be a virtual one. So I take this honor uh, to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Gayatri Palak, ma'am, uh, to the gathering. Ma'am is a professor and head Department of Pain and Palliative Medicine, MNJ Institute of Oncology and uh, Regional Cancer Center, Hyderabad. And uh, ma'am is currently working as consultant to World Cancer Collaboration Canada. And ma'am is also member board of trustee, International Children's Palliative Care Network, ICPCN. And executive committee member, Pain Relief and Palliative Care Society, Hyderabad. Ma'am is also board director for uh, fellowship in Pediatric Palliative Care, Hyderabad and Center for Palliative Care and uh, ma'am is member in the editorial board of Journal of Palliative Medicine and uh, trustee at uh, Hyderabad Center for Palliative Care Trust. 
Ma'am also worked as uh, Board of Directors International Association for uh, Hospice and Palliative Care, Texas from 2010 to 2015 and uh, Palliative Care Consultant at uh, PAC Machine which is a program of action for cancer therapy which is a mission of uh, International Atomic Energy, IAEA. With this uh, very brief introduction, without any further delay, let me welcome ma'am to deliver a talk on standalone working model of palliative care and hospice. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, please join me. So it's a great privilege to be here amongst you. And it was always, as, as always, pleasure listening to Dr. Uh, Shiv Kumar sir. With his, um, passionate, uh, his passion for uh, uh, his subject uh, and, and his passion for uh, providing palliative care to people who can't get all right. So thank you very much for supporting and inviting the session. So when uh, Dr. Dhan asked me to do a, um, some kind of presentation on palliative care, he informed me that there's already so much happening in Swins and uh, and there's already soon you're going to start a full-fledged palliative care uh, um, um, unit there in the things. So it, I really want to congratulate all of you that is going to happen. In that context, my presentation would be around just reflecting on what is it required if you plan a palliative care program in your hospital? What are the things we must take into consideration? And this is entirely pure, or purely based on some evidence which internationally people recommend and some of which, which I'm going to show, talk about as a example from my own program which I do in Hyderabad. So it, um, permit me to share my slide. And of that, I hope you can see my slide. Just want to confirm. And somebody can uh, just let me know. Yes, 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 yes. So I want to start my presentation on very a very uh, a nice statement which I thought is so relevant to all of us when we plan something new or something for the uh, for institution. Patients are the center of all care, and care should be tailored to meet the, meet the individual needs of the patient, not patients meeting the needs of the health system. I thought it's a very powerful statement, and this is all the more relevant, uh, relevant because today, in the today modern era, we are all talking about person-centric care. All health care is leaning towards person-centric care. So, if we are discussing about developing a hospital, palliative care program in your hospital, it's all about then meeting the needs and preferences of people living with life-limiting illnesses and their families. So Shukma said spoke about chronic kidney diseases as one example of life-limiting condition. And I work in a cancer hospital, so I'm the classic example. So all those life-limiting illnesses, if, if we are going to take care of such patients and their families, so that's something we always must bear in mind when we plan a palliative care program in a hospital. So typically, when you talk about in what different way we can provide palliative care in a hospital, the most common setup which we see the world over is the outpatient care or a daycare facility, where a large number of patients come to one one place where the consultants and the multidisciplinary team sit together and offer care. So in a typical example in my hospital, it's very busy outpatient care and the daycare center. And uh, at one point of time, we take care of large number of patients and we, it's much cheaper option when we use much less resources. That's one example of how we can deliver palliative care in a hospital. And the second most common, which is more common in most uh, other, uh, like in the Western world is providing inpatient consults. That means a team, there will be a team of palliative care, uh, multidisciplinary team uh, involving uh, all the disciplines coming together. They move from, there, there are refer uh, reference happening in different wards and they go from ward to ward and provide consultancy service. And this is 90% of, if you look at the national cancer centers in the United States, they have this inpatient consults. This is what the mo uh, more common there. Then comes the acute palliative care unit, and that is something I think you are, um, I think, going to uh, develop in your hospital. It's very similar to this model, that acute palliative care unit, where there will be a dedicated palliative care inpatient facility. 
uh, and it will be like an intensive care because we are talking about very medically complex patients receiving comprehensive care with the help of highly specialized interdisciplinary teams. So what we have to remember is that when a patient is nearing end of life or advanced condition, there is a multi-system involvement, multiple problems coexist, multiple complex medical problems and they really, really need a highly specialized uh, a care. And for that, like for example, what we do typically in acute palliative care unit is patient may come with severe excruciating pain, so there's a rapid titration of uh, pain uh, analgesics, titration of uh, and giving pain relief. We talk about palliative sedation for refractory symptoms like delirium or dyspnea. So these are very complex, difficult symptoms which which are being managed because they they have their own staff highly trained and they do just that. So this is an example of an acute palliative care unit. And then more and more there is a uh, trend of uh, providing, offering palliative care in emergency and critical care. What we have to understand is that when a patient walks to emergency, a, a huge significant amount, a number of patients who come to an emergency are with some chronic complex conditions and they come with some acute exacerbation. Classic example is like Shifmar said, said chronic kidney disease, they become extremely dyspneic and they rush to the emergency. So it is a condition which is a chronic kidney disease, but they have some acute exacerbation. So having a palliative care team right there in the emergency or in the critical care, sometimes it's very helpful to deal with those patients better. The better outcome is found when you have such team present in the emergency or critical care. So let's talk about just the palliative care un uh, a unit which, you, uh, which all of us may you are going to have in your hospital or I already have in my hospital. What are the things which we must take into consideration when we set up such unit in a hospital? First of all, we have to define a target population. Like the swims, you have uh, all the broad and superficialities, uh, my understanding. And so you'll have different uh, end stage conditions. You will have chronic kidney disease, cancer, chronic um, heart diseases, neurological conditions, geriatric patients. So who's going to be a target population when you set up that unit? Is it going to open to all or particular disease conditions? So for example, in my cancer hospital, I look after only cancer patients. Whereas in my community program, I have all kind of uh, end stage conditions which I look after. And so the, the program will be then catering to the specific needs and, and uh, inputs based on that uh, disease condition. So that's something we have to bear in mind, who is going to be our target population. Always it is advisable to start small, just think about some disease conditions where you are comfortable dealing with before you expand the scope to bigger population. Let's understand our patient profile. Whichever disease condition you talk about, the patient profile is going to be such a way that they are patients with very restricted mobility. They can't be on their own, they need support. And so often they be accompanied by more than one caregiver. In a typical hospital, we allow only a one caregiver to come with the patient. Rest are, we say, stay outside, there are visiting hours, come only during that time. But here the situation may be different. They may need more than one caregiver. And often in end of life care, definitely the family wants to be around. So when we plan such a unit, we have to take into consideration this aspect. Like these are the people who have very restricted mobility and they need more support. So when you plan such a unit, we should have an easy access to patients. We should allow family and caregivers. We should be comfortable waiting area, not just for the patients, but also for caregivers. Dr. Um, Sukuma sir mentioned about caregiver distress, caregiver stress. Majority of the stress breaks up when the caregiver and the hospital, because they take up so much of responsibility, running around, helping the patient, and then doing the setting, going for the labs, getting the things done in the house, um, pharmacy, paying the bills they have a tremendous amount of um, stress. So taking care of their well-being, we, we call caregivers as hidden patients. So it's important that uh, these pay, uh, families are also equally supported. So they, their comfort should also be taken into consideration when you're planning such a unit. And as I said, these patients are, cannot walk. So wherever you're going to set up the unit, I have seen in many hospitals, palliative care is something, oh, okay, that's not, 
to their top in my prior list of priority of this uh, things so okay so after thought okay you take that one last room one corner room where no one is using that then why don't you open up that room and start parenting here this is usual like kind of a response you can have because that is not at the top in the, in the, uh, the list of things so often when that, that happens there's hardly any access and these patients can't go step up go to take the steps and they one corner room no ventilation that is not helpful we are talking about a very highly um, special need pa required patient who cannot walk so we should have a, a program where you have a more, more open space with good waiting area good access to trolleys and wheelchairs shukma said spoke about i don't know whether you remember sir highlighted this tragic trip remember that most organ failure patients whichever organ we are talking about they undergo frequent hospitalization when the day they diagnosed to have okay the progressive disease condition there are multiple crises multiple times they come to the hospital they get better they go home again they come to the hospital hospitalized they get better go home it goes on on and on slowly the overall the general condition declines and finally the death happens this is the trajectory which kumar said spoke about in just a, a, in our previous presentation so what we have to re realize is these pa these are the patients who require frequent admissions multiple times admissions not one time that fracture you get admitted for 7 days recover surgery over go home no they come back again and again again and again so ideally palliative care should be integrated along the disease trajectory as early as possible and law entirely along the disease continuum and when they seek for admission they should have that provision to have a comfortable admission uh, so when you plan such center this uh, recommendation again this is a recommendation that we should have the unit very aesthetically designed so that they don't come feel bad about getting coming back to the hospital and getting admitted because this they spending their lifetime coming back again and again and it is not like shukma said said it's not just matter of few days within one full year a few years they come back with repeated admission so if they have a nice aesthetically designed rooms comfortable beddings furnishing storage space where they can keep their belongings comfortably and there's a provision for the family members to stay comfortably i am coming back to the family member again and again because they are also accompanying the patient all the time they exhausted tired they need to sometimes um, uh, work um, if they are that kind of patients uh, coming from that background they can work from there if uh, they are not from poor background so but the point i want to make here is that both patient and the caregivers should be made as comfortable as possible most of these patients especially as the disease progresses they spend long hours in their bed or maybe they never get up from the bed except when going to the bathroom or not at all everything is happening in the bed they don't get to see day and night at all totally cut off from the world that is not like we wish for ourselves isn't it so we want to see the nature but in a hospital you can't but at least this is the least we can offer moving the bed to a place tall tall windows nice lighting that uh, and special beds where the patient can still see what's happening outside so they still feel some connection to the nature and that's something we should bear in mind when we planning a setup i am just sharing a picture of a public hospital where there's a small nice palliative care unit in telangana it's a very rural uh, area hospital in the uh, in the chevala mandal of varangareddy district they they started this palliative care unit so if you see but we were involved in the planning stage so we planned in such a way that all the beds were placed next to nice windows with light enough lighting coming and the families are provided a, a nice resting place for the them to rest by the bed bed side so in the limited resources also it's not so difficult to plan to make sure that they they are, uh, even though it's one ward but still the family can stay as a unit and they are uh, they are supported so this is just an example and similarly these patients they, when they need to go to bathroom or to uh, uh, toilet they may not they may invariably need wheelchairs or sometimes even trolley so we must plan the toilet facilities in such a way that it's a friendly wheelchair access and they can use the facility uh, according to their need so it there should be a dis uh, disabled friendly access to the toilets and bathrooms similarly remember that our patients all their life they may be used to certain kind of um, 
toilet habits. So suddenly if you provide seating kind of commode, they may not be comfortable. Or it can be other way out. Patients may be very sick, they can't squat and they need seating. So there must be provision for both depending upon the population you are going to cater. So this is something we don't think too much uh, in planning, but in, uh, we give due consideration to these aspects when you're planning a palliative care unit. And of course, our patients are very frail, very fragile. They're high risk for fall. They always one one fall and that will be end of it. They'll have developed some uh, major fractures or injuries. So they risk for fall. They're very frail. So we must have the fall risk. Uh, um, pro, pro, all the provision to prevent that, like removing unnecessary clutter, have the railings as they walk in the bathrooms, they have railings to hold, and uh, maybe night clamps as they walk along, and enough lighting so that they don't fall, especially these things happen in the night time. So fall risk uh, assessment and uh, taking care of that. If they have the access, maybe um, Take once in a while if they can really be mobilized. And we encourage all our patients to be mobilized as much as possible. Only very, very end of life care, they stay in the bed. Otherwise, when I mean, there's a nice, beautiful sunshine outside, we say, why don't you take the patient out? So if your hospital has that provision, I, I, it would be very ideal if the facility is closer to such space, green space, and they can be wheelchair friendly, walkways, pathways can be created so they can be moved out. Staffing, last few slides. Uh, Staffing is one big issue because remember that palliative care, other than that building or the ward which we create, it's not a very high end proposition. We are not discussing, uh, we are not investing on high end machines or very expensive medications. But our major expense goes towards staffing. As I said, patients are very complex medical conditions, so they need high staff patient ratio. So normally they talk about not just the high staff patient ratio, but skilled workforce. They should be adequately trained. They need really good training to take care of such patients. As you must be aware that now there are postgraduate training programs happening. So more and more specialists to palliative care are come passing out every day. Similarly, nurses recently, the nursing counselors started a one year fellowship in palliative nursing. So these are all more and more we are going to have a skilled workforce very soon in, in in our um, support facilities. So workforce means a multidisciplinary. We need social workers, counselors, pharmacists, physiotherapists, maybe uh, spiritual um, healers. Um, all uh, they all can support our patient. So we think about the, a multi good multidisciplinary team who are trained to take care of such patients. Ideal uh, this, the recommendation is that for uh, 1.5 patient, uh, one uh, one nurse. But that may not be possible in most of the Indian facility. In, in my center, we have around uh, six to eight patients, one nurse. Very high nurse patient rate compared to my other wards. So, but I insist on having this kind of um, high nurse ratio. How many physicians do you need? Again, depends upon number of beds you have, number of services. Many programs, the physicians also, they go for home visits. So are, are, is your doctor going to make the home visit or not? and number of educational activity he may have to undertake, research activity, what is the administrative responsibility. Based on all that, number of physicians you have to decide. But they, generally they say, if you have a 10 to 15 bed facility, and having a home care facility of a program of 40 beds, and they need to teach three hours a week, and having a, uh, um, consults, 10 to 15 patients out of our consults, then one physician. So this is a general recommendation. Um, it's up to us, like how we're going to decide. But physician is an important critical element uh, in all of this program. Once you start a palliative care program, I'm telling you, your numbers will go up like anything. There will be huge demand for beds, and there will be waiting lists. So we have to really early on decide your admission criteria. With which our patients will be um, be admitted in the ward? What will be the length of stay? What will be the admission criteria? Uh, what is there any scale which you use to decide the severity of symptom and decide the admission? So that can be established early on by the palliative care team. Similarly, we must have some standardized documentation format for the patients. So, for example, this is especially relevant when you talk about geriatric patient or pediatric patient because age appropriate uh, documentation format for for such special population you must take into consideration. 
So whenever you go with a new project to administration, they'll say money, where is the money? How much it's going to cost? If you don't have a good financial planning, no, there will be no takeover for your program. I'm saying such high doctor patient ratio, nurse patient ratio, who's going to give us all that? Uh, how are we going to account for, uh, what is that we're going to give back to the hospital? So one thing we have to tell, we have to make it very clear, it's only human resource. For us, it's mostly human resource. So again, that may not be liked by most administration, but that's what it is, and it determines high human resource. But what we, we they have to understand is that how we actually reduce cost to the hospital because we prevent unnecessary investigation, hospitalization, high intense care, and this all indirectly reduces the hospital cost. And not only to the hospital, but also to the family. We prevent serious financial toxicity to the family. So indirectly, yes, we may not bring a lot of money, but indirectly, we actually reduce cost to the hospital and we spare the beds, spare the lab investigations for the, those who really need it. So. Uh, it, it's more and more hospitals say, adopting palliative care is for this simple reason. And then each hospital, we must have our own institutional protocol as to what is that uh, our end of life care policy is going to be. Are we we encourage withholding, withdrawing life support? What is our policy on advanced care planning, euthanasia? Because the institutional policy is one, and it should be based on what is the prevailing law in the country or, um, or in your state. We must be aware of that because we are, after all, dealing with death and dying in the hospital. And there should be continuous um, effort towards quality improvement. And quality improvement is always, remember, it should be patient and family-centered outcome. So, um, and last few slides. Uh, most patients, if given the choice, they want to go home. So a patient in your hospital, very soon he'll say, I want to go home. So we should be prepared for this care transition. Okay, if this patient goes home, who is where, who is going to take care of this patient in the home setting? Where will he go? Which is the nearest center which can offer, continue to offer support? You are being a tertiary hospital patients, you must be having a lot of floating population. So what will be the care transition plan? It should be well planned and coordinated. And a lot of resources we can take from the community by linking with a lot of community network. And uh, that is very essential for them. Like in the introduction, it was mentioned that I work in a tertiary cancer hospital, which is a mental cancer institute, which is in Hyderabad next to Devapa Hospital. It's a huge hospital with a lot of big patient load, and we have a formal department of palliative medicine. I will show you how it works in MNJ, just as an example, case study, like how it is typically established in MNJ. So MNJ department, we have a department of palliative medicine, which is a nodal center for clinical services, training, research, and advocacy. We have all the formulations of opioid which is available in the country, like morphine, fentanyl, methadone, buprenorphine, all the formulations provided by the government, and these are given free of cost to the patients. We have a very beautiful multidisciplinary team of doctors, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, physiotherapists, and we have a DNB program for palliative medicine, where we have a lot of residents who are uh, do undergo uh, training with us. We, all the different services we provide, symptom management, counseling, bereavement support, end-of-life care, psychosocial support, specialized nursing issues like lymphedema, wound care, care of the bedridden. So a lot of uh, these are nursing issues which are uh, supported by our highly skilled nurses. Different services we have, outpatient, like I mentioned, we have inpatient consults, we go from ward to ward. We have our own palliative care ward. Um, where our own staff man the war and take care of very complex conditions and a very unique children's palliative care program. We have a huge pediatric oncology wing and a, our children program is very unique in the way that it is well integrated. From the day when a child walks to the hospital, the palliative care team also gets into picture. Initially, maybe just counseling and support, then maybe helping with procedural pain and over a period of time, depending upon the condition, they get more and more involved. So very well integrated for those. This is a very typical example of our patient waiting area. Average we see 70 to age 80. I would say 50% of these patients are still undergoing concomitant treatment, undergoing radiation or chemotherapy for their disease directed treatment. While they finally they also receive palliative care. And uh, this is our ward. We have 24 hour staff, highly trained staff, residents are there all the time and taking care of our patients. So just to give an example, what kind of patients we see in the ward, if you look at a six months profile, 
In six months, we admitted 532 patients. 17% were actually only for end of life care. 83% were acute symptom uh, care, like severe pain, severe dyspnea, or delirium. So end of life care were only for 17%. Whereas huge turnover, because of this reason, huge turnover. They get symptom better, they say, okay, I'm going home. And then they come back to the outpatient. So this is how we, uh, the profile of the patient in the world. And when this patient say, I'm going home, so we have it, this link up with the NGO in Hyderabad, through which we have a very extensive home care program happening in the city of Hyderabad. So these patients are then automatically registered in a home care program, and they continue to get support in their homes. Many times patients become very sick. They can't be managed in the home. And then that's the time we have a hospice facility, both separately for adult and children. So they come back to the hospice where very highly uh, end of life care, particularly if patients are managed, Shivmas had mentioned about the hospice, and we do have a hospice where to go to such patients. If the patients are from districts, because I, again, MNJ is a center or where, from where a lot of patients are from districts. So if they're going back to districts, government of Telangana has developed a district-based palliative care program. Every district hospital, there's a palliative care center. And this is one Khammam center, a small unit there, and they also have a home care. So we refer them to the respective district. So the patient need not come back to the uh, city for end of life care or for the needs. Even they have morphing in this district facility. The transition of care is um, smoother than uh, what we hope for. So this is how this transition of care happens. Tertiary hospital, hospice, home care, or district. So wherever the patient is moving, they can continue to get care. So to sum up, if you have a hospital-based facility, Patients get this choice of early palliative care. So it's a beautiful thing to happen, and I really am happy that it is happening in your hospital. And we know that when you have such layer of extra layer of support, how it improves the quality of life of patients in terms of symptom management, better satisfaction, and care for the patient, and judicious resource utilization of the hospital, and smoother transition of the patient to palliative and end of life care. So with that note, I end my presentation. Now, next I would like to invite our Organizing Secretary of today's CME, Professor Pranabhadra Das, sir, to deliver the talk on Scope of Services at PPW SYO SWIMS. How are we doing? Om Namah Vikati Shai. A very good afternoon to one and all. So, so I would like to say the briefly about uh, the, the Scope of Services and, and the pain and pilot they have been. PPW, so in SBIO swims. So as you know, the theme of this year of the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day is the resolution since 10 years. So how are you doing? So as ma'am, uh, as told about in detail about the palliative care and hospice, what's happening in the men's IU and all. So we started an humble beginning since two years. So this all this start of our journey started uh, from uh, the 7th to 16th December 2022 with the organization of the programs as a 10 days workshop, that's a 10 days foundation course in palliative medicine, foundation uh, of course of palliative nursing. So, uh, trying to uh, offer the skills and the, the enhancement of the skills among the 15 and uh, around 30 doctors as well as paramedical staffs. Then, uh, after that, uh, within three months, we got the sanction of the administration. So, on 4th February, the World, World Cancer Day, we uh, got the privilege to the start our uh, the, the pain and palliative care wing at Swims, which is located in the fifth floor of the Sri Padmavati Medical College Hospital. So it's being inaugurated by the Honorable Collector that time and uh, JU and uh, Bengal Madam and uh, Vice Chancellor of the Vedic University. So these are the few reminiscences for uh, the, the 4th February 2023. So at present, so what the services we are catering at PPW? So the primary services, uh, whatever is being offered with the, the close collaboration by the four departments, so radiation oncology, anesthesiology, community medicine, as well as nephrology, because uh, 
the major kepler equations now in the paralytical world is nephro so in the cross consultation with other specialty and super specialty in swims and spmch so uh, the at present uh, uh, since uh, nearly 2 years we have uh, the provided uh, the nearly 1000 patients in opds we have seen nearly 1000 patient opds then uh, nearly 500 patients in ip and more than 200 patients in the day care so this is uh, the small uh, the statistics we got so since 2 years whatever uh, these are our activities show for the in patients the admission and discharges and uh, the palliative care services whatever you offer and uh, these are certain activities uh, whatever is happening because now the interns so those uh, who were coming for uh, their weekly the peripheral posting so they are getting trained they are just sharing our uh, the experience with them and in the opd as well as it and uh, as you know the who needs palliative care so as ma'am uh, has told very clearly that mnjo is broadly offering the onco palliation as part of institutional protocol but in the periphery as part of the hospice and all they are offering other palliative care services so here the onco palliation for the cancer patients neuro palliation as you know for the paralysis and dementia patients the nephro palliation for ckd and the bright stage the renal disease pulmonary palliation for the copd interstitial lung disease cardiac palliation for the cardiomyopathy and heart failure patients then uh, the debility and old age patients and uh, the bereavement patients as i must told very clearly uh, how the is a part of the protocol end of life care as well as bereavement so which is mostly offered to the family and close relatives so here uh, i would like to highlight what we have been offering is mostly uh, the onco palliations apart from that nephro palliations and uh, the pulmonary palliations too so can uh, see the broadly we are covering in the three categories onco nephro as well as pulmonary palliations so so what are the achievements so the achievements we 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 Have, but we had the number beginning again same thing whatever experience and knowledge we have for last one and a half years other two years so we have given the training uh, to nearly 150 doctors those on the periphery psc csc and uh, the area hospital doctors and 500 working staffs mostly the nms mlsp and asa workers as part of our district cancer control programs and uh, we have offered uh, the nearly the training as well as is a part of their peripheral postings so nearly 250 interns since 2 years and uh, it's a part of their regular uh, the weekly uh, peripheral visit to the pain pilot campaign so apart from that we have been running the regular academia for them so like weekly the seminars and uh, and we have been uh, getting taking the classes for them weekly three classes as being uh, mentioned here so in the various topics on the pain palliative care and uh, apart from that we have been uh, uh, the calling the few experts from outside so just to briefly highlight a few so dr gilly bonds who is uh, who is visited 7 february in 2023 so 3 days after inauguration of our uh, institute uh, like our uh, department like tpw pain pilot care being so uh, ma'am is considered to be uh, one of the uh, the mother figure rather uh, she, she used to she told she was a teacher to rema rajgopal so she she contributed lot towards the pain and pilot care programs in our country so she she was happy and she expressed her Uh, appreciation after visiting and uh, she appreciated our humble beginning so we stayed to our ward and i interacted with the patients and uh, this is all uh, few reminiscences and another international expert she is being associated with the pain palliative uh, palliative india trivendram dr radha venkateshan so she is uh, spending most of her time in the uk and uh, visiting india nearly 2 to 3 months so during uh, So as part of a hand holding program, so Madam agreed to stay with us nearly one week, 
and she had uh, she had her precious experiences and uh, she had very the the guiding inspirations and uh, since last 22 uh, 25 years of experience in the field of palliative care and she used to be one of the teacher for our foundation course in palliative medicine too so another uh, visiting professor is an international expert in the pain management so dr kv rao so is a, from chicago usa she is one of the, uh, the international and the world power and uh, she had he had a vision to uh, work in collaboration with sweeps and to develop to the different labels and uh, so she shared uh, some visions with us so um, he visited to our uh, department and uh, uh, pain palliative care wing and interacted with the uh, director sir and other core team members of the pain palliative care wing and she had uh, uh, her experiences and wanted to work in close coordination with us and wanted to work in some international collaborative research group from Denmark and uh, the, the University of New York. So these are few visions I so would like to know. Uh, so, the, so we wanted to develop the full pleasure department. At present it's a pain palliative wing. We are telling the wing. It's not a full pleasure department. And our vision is to start the pain, uh, MD in palliative medicine course. And one year uh, specialized training uh, in the palliative course, both nursing as well as the one year fellowship course in the, so the post MD. And uh, so naturally so with the international collaborations, we wanted to work in close coordination with uh, the experts from those who wanted to so extend their support to our institutes and at present we require the the, the full fledged uh, the requirement of the regular staffs and the trained doctors nursing staffs clinical psychologists medical social workers and occupational therapists and uh, so now this is wanted to uh, inform to director sir just to help us in making it happen since uh, Two, two years, two to three years, we uh, rather the, more than two years, we have been trying to sign this MOU with the Palim India and uh, recently with Dr. K. V. Ragaru, who is from Chicago, USA and uh, is a greatest, one of the greatest values uh, to our pain palliative care programs. So after signing the MOU, probably we can work freely with them and we can exchange our experience, knowledge and skills with them. And the current services, uh, as uh, I highlighted earlier, so there is a dedicated uh, the train, um, the team who is trained in the treating the various aspects of the pain and availability of the narcotics, soapers and other adjuvant drugs. So daily OPD services from 2 to 4 p.m. all working days. Daycare services for the patients requiring observations for few hours. Then the separate uh, the air conditions, 8 beds in a 30 bedded IP wards. So at present we are running with 8 beds. So our new facility is getting ready within 3 to 4 months. So we will be having the 30 bedded IP wards facility for the patients requiring the admissions and as well as daycare support. And uh, so it's so all supports whatever we are extending we are trying to uh, do it within 24 into 7 as whenever needed in a cross consultation with uh, other departments, specialty and super specialty departments. So these are the few reminiscences when uh, so we interact with the experts from outside those who came and interact with us. This is the last programs whatever we have organized so six months back. So thank you, thank you one and all. patients will come to our palliative care OPD, there are uh, two scenarios uh, like we have, we want to explain to everyone to understand how palliative care works in coordination with the curative and definitive treatment. So in the first case, uh, one patient is there, his name is Ramaya, he is suffering from pancreatic uh, carcinoma which is affecting head of pancreas, he will come for uh, treatment so how our doctors will progress further it will be explained in this kit Re
So I feel deeply humbled and privileged to stand here to offer the vote of thanks. So at the end of the uh, events. So at the outset, I would like to extend my the profound gratitude at the lotus feet of the the divine Lord, Lord Venkateshwar Balaji. Then I am uh, extremely grateful for the, the kind presence of our director and Vice Chancellor Professor Abhi Kumar Garu. Then uh, who has, uh, who has uh, provided the, the total patterns behind this entire program. And uh, my, my deep regards for the medical superintendent Dr. Ram sir, who was not able to present but he extended his all total supports. So in, in taking shape of this entire programs. 
then Naledi Mohan sir, uh, the Dean Naledi Mohan sir, then uh, Madam, uh, Register Madam Aparna Bikla ma'am, then our organizing chairpersons, so Narendra sir, who was the, the man behind uh, this uh, articulation about the street program, so I was so happy for getting this innovative idea and uh, probably our audience must have been so inspired from this and getting the messages, clear cut messages from this street play and all. And uh, our Sudharani ma'am from uh, the College of Nursing Principal, then uh, our uh, Madhav ma'am from the College of Physiotherapy Principal, and other dignitaries. So then and the entire audience from the BPT, MPT, the BSc Nursing as well as the, the MSc Nursing students. So without your participation, these programs would not have been as a bit expression. So I'm extremely grateful before all of you so for giving a chance to to offer this the, the events before you then uh, our organizing team members those who took it like a challenge within half a day within since yesterday uh, 10 o'clock till today so within half a day they could try their best to spend their uh, the the entire the precious times to give us entire uh, whatever you saw this today's programs as a, as a successful and memorable event, so I am really thankful to them. And our technical teams for the audio-visual team on behalf of the, uh, the ADGM office and uh, the other staffs in the auditorium, so I am really thankful to you. And uh, last but not least, ma'am, uh, we came, uh, our Bharati ma'am, so came all the way, so responded so, so fast yesterday, ma'am, you came and just to inspired us and encouraged us. So, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, one and all. So, last uh, uh, events of the day is uh, to have a group photography. So, I would like to request to our organizing team and uh, all our core team members, including Bharati ma'am and uh, Sudharani ma'am and all, just to be here to have a group photography as a, as a reminiscence of the student's event.